Good morning, everyone. My name is Natalie. I'm going to lead us in reading scripture today. We're going to be in Matthew 28, 16 through 20. If you want to open your Bibles, it'll be on the board here as well. Then the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You guys can be seated. Well, uh, good morning. It's great to be here at the House of Blues for one more week. Um, this is my first time preaching here at House of Blues. To be honest, it's a little intimidating being this high up. You guys are like ants down there. Uh, if you don't know me, uh, my name is Cohen. I'm the college pastor here at Grace City, and I have the privilege of uh, speaking this morning on a topic that's very important. It's almost, uh, it's almost like two sermons in one. I'm speaking uh, on the Great Commission today, Jesus' last words. And so uh, if you've been uh, following along with us, we've been in a series uh, called After the Beginning, talking about Jesus' 40 days on earth after he resurrected from the dead. It's a 40-day period uh, where Jesus is appearing and disappearing and reappearing to his disciples, uh, teaching them things, uh, doing specific uh, signs for them, and uh, basically telling them what it's going to be like when he leaves. And today I, uh, I get the privilege of, of walking through the very last words that Jesus says before he ascends. And these are not just his words to his disciples, but they are his lasting words to his church and what his, uh, what his mission is for the church. Um, and so uh, if, you, if you'll read with me again uh, this text, Matthew 28, 16 through 20, we're going to look uh, at what exactly Jesus says again. And we're going to start off by thinking about what would it be like to be one of these 11 disciples uh, standing in front of Jesus on this mountain, hearing these words. Because uh, if, if you've been a Christian for a while, or if you've been in church for a while, you may have heard these, uh, these verses a lot, uh, and they can kind of fall on deaf ears. They can kind of feel numb now. But to these disciples, these were pretty wild words, pretty crazy words, and they honestly probably didn't know what to think at first. They probably thought Jesus was mistaken, like a lot of other things Jesus says. They probably were thinking, Jesus, are you sure? That doesn't exactly sound like a great idea. We're not exactly the people to carry this out. So let's, uh, let's put ourselves in the situation of these disciples and read this passage again. So he says, the 11 disciples traveled to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them, and when they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Before we dig into this, I'm going to pray for our time here. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the ministry of your son. We thank you for the example that he gave us, the perfect example and the mission that he calls us to. God, I pray that you would speak by your spirit through your scripture and through me this morning. And whatever you want us to hear, would it be heard? And whatever um, is not part of that, would, would it just fall to the floor, God? Would you open our ears to hear and our eyes to see. In Jesus' name, amen. So imagine being one of the 11 disciples in this moment. Okay, you've been, uh, you've been following Jesus around for three years, seeing his ministry, seeing him perform signs, miracles, and seeing uh, his powerful teaching of self-denial and uh, being focused on others and not yourself. And he's proclaiming the kingdom of God. And you're thinking, this is the Messiah. He's about to destroy Rome. He's about to take everything down. It's going to be great. And then he lets the Romans kill him. You're like, okay, that's not what I was expecting. Jesus says all, uh, all the disciples will fall away. He says that uh, the night of the Lord's Supper, and pretty much all of them uh, do. And they abandon him, and they, they go off, and they, they mope, and they're sad, basically. And they're, they've reached basically their lowest point. And then a few days later, he's live again. 
And they're thinking, all right, now he's going to destroy the Romans. Now he's going to destroy the Romans. He had to defeat death first. Now he's going to de- destroy the Romans. But he doesn't say that. He doesn't really say anything like that. He says, now that I've defeated death, I'm going to hand everything over to you guys. A bunch of knuckleheads. You just take it over. Now, if you're the disciples, you're probably hearing this in the moment, and you're thinking, um, Jesus, we just abandoned you. Uh, our like, kind of leader here, Peter, just denied you three times, and uh, we don't really know what we're doing. We've kind of been proving that for the last three years, that we have absolutely no clue what we're doing, and everything we've ever done that's beneficial, you've basically just done it through us. So this whole idea of you handing it off, it doesn't really seem like the right time, doesn't really seem like the right place. Also, the Romans are still in charge. Could you please just do something about that? Like, you still haven't really talked about the Romans. Uh, And Jesus doesn't really say anything like that. He spends this entire 40-day period, all we know in Scripture is that he spends this 40-day period uh, teaching them about how he's fulfilled the law of Moses, the prophets, and the writings of the Old Testament. Um, And now... His last words are, I've defeated death. I have all authority over everything that's ever existed. And they're probably expecting like, yes, now you're going to destroy the Romans. Now go make disciples. Just go do what I've done to you. No mention of anything of an earthly kingdom. And so once again, Jesus' plans for the millionth time, they don't sound like the type of plans that you would craft if you're trying to start the greatest, most widespread, most diverse movement of anything that's ever existed. But here we are today, 2,000 years later, and the church of Jesus Christ, the Christian church, uh, has expanded all over the world. We know that the plan, and it worked. And so we're going to look at our roots, basically, today. We're going to look at how this whole thing happened, and we're going to look at how the age that we live in now, the church, how that came to be. What was the tipping point that changed everything? Okay, so uh, an example of maybe what Jesus is doing here. Uh, Brian, Brian preached last week on Peter's restoration. Peter, he was kind of like the head disciple. He's like Jesus' Jesus's right-hand man. Okay, he, he was closest to him. He was, I mean, he's honestly really annoying. You read the stories and you're just like, Peter, just stop talking like, every single thing you say and do, we're just, we just wish you would do the opposite. But somehow he was Jesus' right-hand man. And we saw last week that uh, Peter, after he had seen the risen Jesus, he knew that Jesus was resurrected. Uh, basically, he goes back to being a fisherman. Why? You would think, oh, we, we hear all the time, oh, the disciples, once, they were so sad, but once they saw that Jesus had defeated death, their whole lives were changed. Their whole lives were changed. They were re-energized with this boldness to go share the gospel and to make disciples. But we see last week with Peter that wasn't exactly immediately true. See, Peter had seen the risen Jesus, and one of the following times Jesus appeared to them on the shore uh, was because Peter thought he had blown it. He had denied Jesus three times. He rejected him. He abandoned him in his hour of need. And Peter was probably just sitting there in silence like, oh my, oh my goodness, Jesus is there. He did defeat death, and I've blown it. I probably can't follow him anymore. I probably can't follow him anymore. But what do we, what do we see happen? If you were, if you were here, here last week, you remember the story. Jesus met him right where he met him the first time, three years before, on the shore fishing. Performs the same miracle, and then says the exact same words. He says, Peter, follow me. You would think, Jesus, once again, This is not the kind of person you want to give this sort of power. You don't want this guy. All the other people, all the other disciples followed his lead and abandoned you. And they they just did what he did. And now they've gone back to being fishermen, just like Peter. And you're telling him to now lead your church. This is this is Jesus' grace. This is Jesus' plan. He knows what's going on. And this is, we can really see that as a blueprint for how Jesus calls people to do his work. He drains them of every ounce of pride they could possibly have in their own ability. And then he says, follow me, follow me. Just as Jesus made disciples, his disciples are now called to make disciples. And as his disciples today, these words are for us. We're not called to associate ourselves with church and Christianity, but we're called to devote ourselves to the way of Jesus. Those two things are different. We are called to be disciples 
apprentices, understudies, students, followers of Jesus in all of his ways. And we're to bring others into that, remembering, as Jesus says, that somehow, even though he's going away, he will be with us always. And we hear that and we think, okay, that's like a nice little sentiment about like, oh, my grandma passed away, but she's with us. She's with us always. And I don't think that that's what Jesus means here. As we get to uh, the end of this passage, we will expound more on what that means. But every word that Jesus says here is a life-giving word. And so we're going we're gonna to break down all, all of what Jesus says in this passage and really understand what he means here. So looking at these first three verses, you can throw that passage uh, back up. Starting in 16, the 11 disciples traveled to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted, some doubted. Jesus came near to them and said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, Jesus qualifies what he's about to command by addressing his authority. And if we do not believe Jesus' claim of authority here, then his commission should just be ignored. There's no point in heeding Jesus' commands if you do not submit to the fact that he has this authority. And so has he proven this authority? Has he proven this authority? Because if he hasn't, we should not really be giving ear to this great commission. So how should we think about this? Has he proved this? Well, the wording of this passage kind of reminds me of uh, the Old Testament. It kind of reminds me of Moses on Mount Sinai. So Moses, if if you don't know who Moses was, he wrote the first five books of the Old Testament. Moses was God's representative. He was like God's disciple in a way. He was his understudy, his apprentice. He was doing the work of God on earth. God called this one man to be the head of Israel and the leader, this focal point of Israel. They they were to follow Moses as he followed God's commands. In a way, Moses made disciples of the Israelites, okay? And Moses... Moses uh, was a witness, obviously, to God's great salvation out of slavery in Egypt. This is the great story of the Old Testament, that the Israelites were saved out of slavery in Egypt in this supernatural way that they could never do themselves. So Moses, Moses knew that, that God had this authority. There was one God, not many pagan Egyptian gods like they had been raised around. There was one God who had authority over heaven and earth, and God had proved this authority by his great salvation of the Israelites. And so uh, God proved himself to Moses with this salvation, and he writes uh, over and over in the book of Exodus that God saved the Israelites out of Egypt with a mighty right hand. It's this imagery for like the strongest part of your body, the thing that you eat with, you fight with, cook with, you do everything with your strong arm. And Moses writes over and over, God saved the Israelites with a mighty right hand. He proved himself to the Israelites. He proved his authority to the Israelites um, by not holding anything back. He uses his strongest, his strongest part, basically, of himself to save them. He, he showed him this, the extent of his power. And now we see that Jesus has done the exact same to his disciples. He's defeated death, just like, just like uh, God defeated, basically, a type of death by bringing the Israelites out of Egypt. And a few seconds from now, a few moments from now, Jesus is about to ascend from the disciples and take his seat at the right hand of God, the very right hand that God saved Israel with out of Egypt. And so Jesus has more than, a, more than proved his authority to give this command to the Israelites. And that justifies what he is about to say, because it's a big claim what he's about to say. He's about to say, go into every single people group on earth and teach them to devote themselves to me. This is a huge command. Have you ever heard of anyone else making any sort of, any type of statement that's even close to this? Go into every single group of people that you could ever imagine and teach them to devote themselves to me because I'm, I have authority over everything. I've defeated death. That's exactly what Jesus says here. So let's define some of these words here. Let's read the rest of the passage starting in, in verse 19. Jesus says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. Make disciples. What is a disciple? 
A disciple is where we get the word discipline. A disciple is one who disciplines themselves to be like the one that they follow. In this day, there were many disciples of Greek philosophers. They would follow them around, hearing every single thing they said. They would give up their livelihoods to follow these philosophers or a rabbi or something like that. And Jesus, Jesus did the exact same thing. Now, a disciple, like we said, a disciple disciplines themselves to follow their master closely. A disciple follows closely with their eyes wide open, trying to absorb every single thing they can absorb from watching their master. A disciple is an apprentice learning under the ways of a master, an understudy desiring to take on the work of their teacher. A disciple is someone who will follow Jesus no matter the cost. A disciple will be nervous to go places and do things that they've never done before because their master calls them to. But a disciple will be even more nervous to say no and deprive themselves of following their master even further and becoming more like their teacher. So church, the first thing we need to understand if we're to make disciples is that you must be a disciple. The first disciple you need to make is yourself. So if your if your Christianity, if your following of Jesus, if your discipleship to Jesus is not formed, you will not be formed. If you are not formed, you cannot help to form others. If you are not a disciple, you cannot go and make a disciple. So I don't want to speak ahead of where we are, and maybe some of us in this room, if you're if you're thinking right now, maybe I'm not a disciple of Jesus, maybe I just kind of associate with Christianity. Uh, there is an earlier part that you need to be thinking about right now. There's an earlier step before making disciples, and that is, have you committed yourself to be a disciple, an apprentice, a follower, an understudy of Jesus in all of his ways? So take stock today of your discipleship to Jesus. Is it association with Christ, or is it devotion to Christ? Those two things are not the same, and one leads to true life with Jesus, and one, one doesn't. We are to make disciples of all nations. So this word nations, this word that we translate to nations, in the original Greek, it's the word ethnos. Ethnos, it's where we get our word ethnicity. And this does not mean a geopolitical nation like the United States, Canada, France, the Congo, something like that. It means any type of way you could group people together. We're talking about tribes, languages, people groups, The poor, the rich, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, Jew, Gentile, clean, unclean, male, female, educated, not educated, any way that you could group people together, that is a nation. That's a people group. It's a tribe. That's an ethnos. So what is Jesus saying to these disciples, these 11 Jewish people from the same place, these people who are not a collection of all nations? He's saying, you guys go out to all nations, go to all these groups and make disciples. This is a tipping point for the new age of God's people. Okay, the Old Testament prophesied, all the Old Testament pro- uh, prophets foretold over and over and over again how God's people will be the nations. It will not just be the nation of Israel, but Israel was God's chosen servant to reach all the nations. It was never God's plan to have one just sort of monotype people. And these 11 disciples standing on this mountain with Jesus are receiving the call to go and do that. And he wants us, when we're making disciples of all nations, he wants us to baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A fully Trinitarian view. It's a very mystical, complex topic that has made people think super hard for 2,000 years now. How is God one but three at the same time? We don't have, we don't have a week to talk about that. We don't have a month to talk about that. But Jesus clearly cares that that is how we see the God that we follow. He's not, not just saying, follow me, the Son, but the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The whole relationship that I have, the relationship that I am, is what you're being baptized into. And this this symbol of baptism is a unifying thing. 
I've been baptized. Issa's been baptized. Rodney's been baptized this last year. We can share in that experience. God is not telling us to go and make disciples kind of on our own. He's saying, you all are in this thing together. You're making disciples together. You're being unified together, doing the same things together. You're all, prof- like, you're all professing the same thing together. The beginning of your discipleship is marked by this act of baptism. And I want to make a comment here on this idea that we're supposed to make disciples of all nations, because often this kind of just gets tucked into the back, and we don't really think about uh, what we need to do to actually do that and not make disciples of just the people who are like us. And I'll just, I'll just give one point here that if we are going to make disciples of all nations, and this is very important, especially today, if we're going to make disciples of all nations, you have to care about all nations. You have to care about all people groups, all ethnoses. You have to care if you're white, black, white, uh, white, black, Asian, Hispanic, Jew, Gentile, male, female, educated, not, edu- not educated. You got to care about the people groups that you're not a part of. If you're a middle class person, you need to care about the rich and the poor. If you're a white person, you need to care about the black and the Asian and the Hispanic. If you're a Hispanic, you need to care about the white and the black and the Asian. You need to care about the people who are not like you. Otherwise, how are you ever going to teach them how to follow your master, how to follow Jesus? How can you make a disciple if you do not care about going to and learning about someone who is unlike you? How can you make disciples of all nations if you do not care about all nations? It's often sort of preached, go make disciples of all nations, and we really just make disciples of the people who are only right next to us. And we want, you know, we're speaking, I commented already on how Jesus is calling his disciples to take a step toward this unifying thing that is the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations. Jesus is not just saying, I want the world to be uh, worshiping me. He is saying that, but the other side of the coin is he's saying, I want the world to be unified through worshiping me because I'm the only way that that can happen. I'm the only way that all people groups can somehow find something to unify around is they must be devoted to me, their creator. The only one that can fully unify us is the one who fully made us, and that is Jesus. Salvation for all nations is the plan, and it will be achieved whether you're on board or not because all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. And the the last bookend of this teaching of Jesus kind of answers a begging question from the disciples. So they're hearing these commands and they're probably thinking, Jesus, how are we supposed to do this if you're about to leave? You keep talking about how you're going away and now you're handing this off to us, which is also implying that you won't be here to do this in a way. And Jesus knows this. Jesus doesn't think that we we should do this on our own, so neither should we. Jesus qualifies the validity of his plan, the Great Commission, by promising his presence, even though he's about to ascend to the Father. So what does it mean? Naturally, we need to ask some questions. What does it mean that Jesus will be with them until the end of the age? Well, let's, we're going to talk about some prophecies real quick. So in the Old Testament, if you open your table of contents or if you just know your books or something like that, uh, you see in, in the end at the middle end of your Old Testament, you have a lot of people's names. You have people like Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, people like that. Those are prophets, and they prophesied to the Old Testament people of Israel a lot of things. And one of the things they spoke about the most was that God was eventually going to pour out his Holy Spirit onto humanity, that God's Spirit and humans would be united. They would be one. This was not an Old Testament truth. The work of Jesus had to be done in order for people to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And this was prophesied. The prophet Joel, Joel prophesied to the northern kingdom of Israel that God would pour out his spirit on all flesh. Isaiah and Jeremiah prophesied to the southern kingdom of Judah the exact same thing. Like water on dry ground, God's spirit will be poured out on all human flesh and all nations will be his people. I have uh, the prophet Zechariah. We should have that scripture up here. Zechariah, after the exile, after the northern and southern kingdoms were completely obliterated and they went into Babylonian exile, on the way back, the prophet Zechariah said the exact same thing. God said through Zechariah, then I will pour out a spirit of grace and prayer on the house of David and the residents of Jerusalem, and they will look at me whom they pierced. 
They will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly for him as one weeps for a firstborn. Notice the language of this prophecy specifically. God is speaking through Zechariah, and he's saying they will look on me whom they have pierced. This prophecy is saying that God will be pierced. But then in the next breath, this person who will be pierced is also called him. So we can see what this prophecy is talking about. That God is, this, this prophecy is talking about the Son of God, fully God, fully man. He is God and he is man. God is saying he's me and he's him, and he will be pierced. And when they're mourning for me who they have pierced, I will pour out a spirit on the people of Jerusalem, on my people, and they will weep as one weeps for a firstborn. It could only be talking about Jesus, of course. And so many prophets we can see to the northern kingdom, southern kingdom, to the returning exiles, many prophets foretold the day when the Spirit of God would reside in the hearts of man. And Jesus, in his authority, continues that tradition, and he's the last prophet to do so. Now, Jesus was not obviously only a prophet, but he was a prophet nonetheless. And if we were to read John chapter 13 through 17, those five chapters, if you want some light reading, go read those chapters today and just sit on it. You'll met, you can think about it all day and you'll still be wondering what exactly Jesus means. He says in John 13 through 17, he, he gives this long teaching about what it's going to be like when I leave and I send the Spirit to you. Here's what it's going to be like when you live Spirit-filled lives. Instead of lives following another human body around, you're going to be going around being led by my Spirit. It's a, it's a reality that we're kind of uncomfortable with. Sometimes we think, Jesus, why'd you have to go? Why did you have to go back to the Father? Why don't, why don't you just stay here? Wouldn't that be better? Wouldn't that be better? But as we're about to read, we're going to read a snippet of that portion in John. And Jesus is saying, no, it's, it's not better. It's better that I live inside of you and we multiply that way. This is Jesus' plan. Jesus' plan. We could debate about it all day, but Jesus says it's better. In John chapter 16, starting in verse 4, Jesus said, this is just a snippet of a five-chapter-long teaching he gave to his disciples. Jesus said, but I have told you these things so that when their time comes, you will remember that I told them to you. I didn't tell you these things from the beginning because I was with you. But now I'm going away to him who sent me, and not one of you asks, where are you going? They were probably in denial. Yet because I've spoken these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I'm telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I go away, because if I don't go away, the counselor will not come to you. He's talking about the Spirit. If I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. About sin, because they do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I'm going to the Father and you will no longer see me. And about judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Jesus says it's better that me in this body goes away because if I don't go away, you can't receive the Spirit. And that's how all this is going to work. It's no longer, no longer going to be one body that people are brought to God through, but is many bodies, the bodies of all nations filled with the Spirit of Jesus will be bringing people to God. And he will do three things. The Holy Spirit will do three things. His ministry is it consists of three things, basically the same thing Jesus' ministry consisted of. He will convict the world of, one, sin, their need for a Savior. Much of the world doesn't just openly acknowledge their need for a Savior and their sin. The Holy Spirit will convict people. He will go before you to convict people of sin, to prepare hearts to receive the gospel. Number two, he will convict the world of righteousness, righteous, holy, godly character that a believer must grow in. If you are here today and you're a spirit-filled believer of Jesus, is this not true? The spirit convicts you of areas where you're living in sin and convicts you and gives you the power to grow out of those things and into holiness. This is what the spirit does. And number three, judgment. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, Psalm, uh, Proverbs 2 says. And the spirit will convict people of the judgment that God rightly has set apart for those who do not trust in his salvation. The Spirit will do this work. And the disciples are a little in denial before Jesus dies and resurrects. They're, they don't even ask Jesus, where are you going? Because they're just assuming, oh, I just hope it's a metaphor. I hope he's just speaking figuratively. And we see that's not what happens. 
Now, the book of Acts picks up right where the Gospels leave off. It was written by Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke. And we're about to read the first, uh, first few verses of the book of Acts. And it's basically the exact same content as the last verses of the Gospel of Luke. So Luke thinks what's about to happen, the, the promise of the Spirit and Jesus' ascension, is so important that he ends his Gospel with it. And then when he starts the sequel, he, he covers it again. He's like, just so you know, this is the tipping point. This is what changes everything. Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 4. Luke says that while he was with them, while Jesus was with the disciples, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise, which he said, you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? Are you defeating the Romans? Jesus is like, no, it's Bush League. He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. And you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, your city, in Judea and Samaria, your region, and to the ends of the earth, all nations. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, not political power from taking over the Romans, a different type of kingdom power. You will receive it. And he says, I've been telling you this. I've already promised this to you. This is what we talked about. Verse 9, after Jesus had said this, he was taken up as they were watching, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, they were gazing into heaven, and suddenly two men in white clothes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. So we see Jesus' life is his life on earth, His work on earth in the body is bookended by heaven. Um, I should have a diagram up here. Chance Chance made me a diagram. I kind of drew it out on a napkin, and he made me a diagram. I want us to see two timelines here. This top timeline is the life and work and ministry of Jesus. It began by his descent from heaven, born of a virgin. He left heaven to do this work, and he lived faithfully. He died, and he rose again. And this red line from the top right to the bottom left is his ascension. It represents this tipping point between these two timelines, these two ages. And we are called to copy Jesus' life, to go make disciples as he made disciples. And our life, as you can see, it looks a lot like Jesus' timeline. It begins with God descending to earth. The Spirit descends, and our new life begins. And we are to copy Jesus' life. And as Luke says here in verse 11, these angels promise the disciples that just as Jesus ascended into heaven, he will descend from heaven. The next phase is not another ascension, but heaven will fully come down to earth. There will be a new heavens, a new earth, full restoration. We are sowing in all nations so that when he returns, he can reap from all nations. Jesus' life is bookended by heaven. And so it's important now to understand this command that we have, this great commission to go out and make disciples. It does not happen without the Spirit. Jesus says this. It doesn't happen unless he goes away so that he can come back in the Spirit. Very figurative language, but I think we can understand what he means. There is no great commission without the great ascension. Without the ascension, there is no giving of the Spirit. Without the Spirit, we cannot fulfill the Great Commission. The Spirit must work in us and go before us to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, us and others. We cannot do this on our own. So I've kind of touched on it a little bit, but do you remember, have you ever thought about this, that when Jesus died, the disciples lost all motivation? They lost all motivation to follow him, to walk in his ways, and to, and to think about taking this kingdom message and expanding it. They just lost all motivation. They were stopped in their tracks. Even though Jesus said he would die and rise on the third day. He said it, but they doubted. They were completely stopped in their tracks. And many people say that their revival, basically, 
was due that Jesus resurrected from the dead and they saw the resurrected Jesus and then they were motivated to go take it to the nations and to die for their faith. And that's absolutely true, but that's not the full story. That's not the full story. The disciples had completely given up and when they saw him resurrected, they were revived, but they did not go on to do Jesus' work and establish his church and get the wheels rolling for what we know now is the worldwide church of Jesus simply because they were motivated and they saw something. They witnessed Jesus' great power. They were equally motivated and empowered to do this, not just because Jesus was alive, but because Jesus was alive in them. Jesus had given them his power and his witness to do these things. And now we're left with this understanding that we are now the body of Christ. Christ's body has left, and we are now fulfilling that role. Jesus is saying, you're now in this role. I've been thinking about this a lot this week and wrestling with it. I, I think I never really understood the imagery and the metaphor that's going on here, and it really centers around Jesus had a body, and then that body is now gone, and that leaves this gap, and we are fulfilling that. He ministered with his body. He moved his body around to different cities, and he ministered with it, and we are now his body. We see this. If you read your New Testament, you read this metaphor a lot of we're the body, and Christ is the head of the church, which is the body, meaning from the neck down. It's a super strange like way of thinking about it that metaphorically Christ is like your brain and we are the fingers, the toes, the hands and the feet and the legs and the arms. I was just like reading this passage, uh, these passages that we're about to read and I was thinking, man, I could sit here and say like brain, move fingers and it won't, it's not going to do it. But somehow I can just move my fingers with this intangible, my brain's just doing it. I don't know where my like brain, my nerves begin, and the other thing, I don't even know how to describe it, but it's this intangible way that my head is controlling every single thing below it. And Jesus's ascension is a physical representation of what is now going on. He is the head controlling the body by the power of his spirit. I could think about that for so long. It's so weird and so cool. So weird and so cool. And so that is why we need to understand that without the great ascension, there is no great commission. The church would fall flat on its face if Jesus really fully just left and then just stayed gone. The church would not be what it is today. We would not be here 2,000, later, 2000 years later sitting in a concert venue talking about Jesus in Boston, Massachusetts. We wouldn't be doing it. And so it seems like, you know, we have this question now. It seems like there's not a lot of passages about the ascension in the New Testament. And that's kind of right. There's not a lot of passages talking about the actual act of Jesus ascending, but there are so many passages about the ascended Jesus, about where Jesus is right now and what he's doing right now. So often if I asked you like, what do you think of Jesus? Who is Jesus? What did Jesus do? What is like, what is, what's the first thing you think of when you think of Jesus? You may think of a guy sitting on a hillside teaching disciples. You may think of a guy bloodied on a cross. You may think of a resurrected person walking around, appearing to disciples. But it's probably uncommon, I would say, in my experience talking to people, I would say it's pretty uncommon that you think right now Jesus is on the throne of God in heaven, you know, up there. We use up and down just as metaphorical languages because it's, you know, that's all we got. He's outside of this controlling the situation. He has authority in heaven on earth. He's seated at the right hand of God, and he's interceding and praying for his people to the Father, and we are his body. He's the head. He's moving in his people. That's what Jesus is doing right now. So often when we think of what he's done, which is great, we just stop there, and we think Jesus is what he has done. Jesus isn't what he's doing now or what he's going to do. We just think about what Jesus has done. And church, I mean, if we're going to really understand and have a full understanding of what it means to follow Christ, I mean, it makes really no sense to follow Christ if all we're talking about is what he's done and not what he's currently doing. We're following Jesus as he's alive right now on the throne of God, working through us by his spirit. And so if we don't have this understanding of an ascended Jesus 
in an enthroned Jesus, we don't have a full understanding of Jesus as Lord. This is what it means that Jesus is Lord. And so as I, as I close, I want to read a few passages from a, what are called Paul's uh, prison letters, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. And I think as I was reading the New Testament, I was, I was reading kind of with my eyes open, looking for like, why is this important that we know this? It started popping out on every page, things that I normally would just glaze over. And so uh, I want to bring our time uh, to a close by just having some scripture reading. I'm just going to read some passages and just think about how important it is to Paul as he's written all of these things that Jesus is currently on the throne, ascended, and that he is the head of the body. These are at the beginning of all of these letters. Ephesians 1, starting verse 20. He, God, exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens. Far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he subjected everything under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. Paul needs to know that if he's really going to survive in prison and still have faith in, in prison, that Jesus is in control, not the Romans. He's got to have that way of thinking. He has to have that proper theology. In Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 5, Paul writes this poem. He says, Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. That's Jesus' timeline that we saw. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. To the Colossians, chapter 1, he writes this. He writes, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile himself, reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. A couple chapters later is our last passage. Paul says, so if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things above where Christ is seated, is seated, at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not earthly things, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. So the story of Christ choosing who he did to be his disciples should be a huge encouragement to us beyond belief. His disciples did not know what way was up and they constantly failed. And then they abandoned him in his hour of need. The women that followed Jesus had nothing when he came to them. They were uneducated, outcast, oppressed by their society, unclean by Jewish religious standards. So today, if you think Jesus' call to discipleship is not for you, just take another look. Take another look at where this whole thing started. Take another look. Jesus is standing on the shore waiting for the humbled to drop his nets, drop your nets, and follow him. If you are a follower today of a Christ who has not ascended, maybe your view of Christ was, it just stopped a little short. A 
Maybe your view of Christ was not a Christ who is in the ultimate position of authority. Maybe you've had someone in his place. Maybe when you think of sovereignty and authority, you think of Biden or Trump or some other earthly power like the disciples did. Well, I got news for you. There's a, there's a better way. There's a better Lord and that is Jesus. There's a Lord who actually cares about you, unlike a political power of this world. And there's a Lord who can actually bring unity to all tribes and all tongues and all nations and all people groups. And that is Jesus, not a political entity. There's a God who left his position of authority in heaven to bring you with him, and that's Jesus. So for those who already do follow Jesus, or if you're deciding right now to follow Jesus, we have a mission to take a hold of. We make disciples of all nations, and we be with Jesus always.